Hello, everyone. My name is Helen Huey. I'm a PhD student from the psychiatry department. It's a great honor to be speaking with you today. Um, my topic, also as one major part of my PhD project, is about a well-known neurosurgical procedure within the field of psychosurgery named anterior capsulotomy. I'll be talking about his therapeutic, uh, the therape his therape therapeutic mechanism in refractory obsessive compulsive disorder, which we believe to be associated with how brain processes aversive information. Well, uh, have any of you seen this film before? <laughs> If you have no idea or are not familiar with what obsessive compulsive disorder is, then check this piece. Well, As Good As It Gets is a 1997 romantic film starred by the famous Jack Nicholson. Jack, in this movie, played a novelist who struggles to connect with people due to his severe OCD symptoms. Well, and don't be fooled by what he looks like on the poster. He's not a puppy lover. This is what he really looks like <laughs> when he forced to interact with a dog. So look, if you take a closer look, you'll see that he wore gloves in order not to get dirty his hands. Well, therefore, speaking of signs and symptoms of fear of, sorry, fear of dirt, not dog, <laughs> is one major um, OCD sub, uh, subtypes that we will often see in our society. Um, besides, OCD can have other types of manifestation as well, such as a fear of uncertainty, so they develop symptoms like overchecking, others maybe having some fears of intrusive or unwanted thoughts. There are also patients having obsessions of things that look ordered, symmetrical, balanced, and positioned. Well, uh, with correct diagnosis, the next thing we do, crucial, is to help people like Jack to get better. Medications, psychotherapies are all first-line treatments that are likely to be effective in patients uh, like Jack. But however, there are still many of them, which can make up of around 30 to 40 percent, who um, continue to worsen or don't respond well to regular treatment. It is in this population and with the help of a multidisciplinary group that involves psychiatrists, neurosurgeons, social workers, therapists, and caregivers that neurosurgical options can sometimes be considered. Well, um, at present, the most common uh, psych uh, psychosurgeries that in use in clinical practice include um, the um, singulotomy, um, also the capsulotomy we're going to talk about today, but also some uh, very uh, new um, novel brain stimulation techniques such as DBS, the deep brain stimulation. Well, as the focus of the current study, um, anterior capsulotomy is first, first invented in the 1940s, and it works by disrupting the wider matter tracks connecting the prefrontal frontal area with subcortical structures at a special anatomical location called the anterior limb of internal capsule. Uh, the lesion is minimal and is now currently guided by stereotactic techniques, also MR imaging. Um, past um, past research have linked OCD with the dysfunctions in a number of anatomical structures, including those located in the frontal prefrontal area, over here, and others located in the subcortical areas, is over here, and which involves a, a ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and other similar parts. And also in the subcortical areas, we have amygdala, ventral striatum, chordate thalamus, and so on. And these structures and the neural circuits, they form together or participate in the emotional processing OCD that patients often manifest as excessive fear or poorly controlled responses to aversive information. And this vicious circle can look like this in OCD patients. So first of all, you will have thoughts or obsessions that touching the dog will dirty your hands. And then you will develop into fear and anxiety that uh, about how unpleasant and how unhealthy if your hands get dirty. And then you'll be developing into some um, compulsive and excessive behaviors um, like hand washing. And then you are finally get some relief only before you've been dragged back into this vicious circle a second, a third, and a fourth time. So evidence so far have indicated that these dysregulated responses to fear and anxiety um, are mediated by a hyper-connected frontal and subcortical pathway 
uh, these two areas, uh, implicating a overactivated frontal and subcortical structures. And therefore, we hypothesized that the post-surgical functional normalization of these frontal subcortical circuits related to aversive processing may give rise to symptom improvement in OCD after capstotomy. Well, to test this hypothesis, we, we recruited three groups of participants. So first of all, there is a OCD patients after capstotomy. We also have OCD patients without any surgical history, and we also have uh, healthy controls. We, uh, we first ran psychological assessments to make sure there's no uh, any potential side effects that may relate to the surgery in cognitive abilities. And then we, uh, we ran task-based functional MR imaging um, experiment uh, in using two uh, per task bar times, named the, uh, named the aversive task and the expectancy violation task. Uh, to be specific, during the aversive task, we asked those participants to look at, the look at these two types of squares. Red squares indicate aversive images to be coming next, while yellow squares indicate neutral images. During this process, we monitor how people's brain react to situations that is aversive or neutral. And then, 45 minutes later, we ran the expectancy violation task. And this time, there will only be red squares showing in the screen. While people were lying in the scanner, they will see the screen. And, after, and followed, following that, there will only be uh, neutral images. So during this process, we monitor how people's brain react to situations that they initially expected to be aversive, but were instead harmless. We got some very interesting results. <laughs> First of all, in terms of the treatment outcome, um, capstotomy group, represented by the shaded area in these three figures, have seen a significant improvement, like a reduction in their symptom severity, also in their depression. We also see improvement in their quality of life. As for the psychological assessments, we find no significant group differences between patients after the surgery and patients with an, without any surgical history. So in other words, capstotomy procedure is a, is a relatively safe neurosurgical intervention with little impact over your general cognitive abilities. Uh, for the task-based functional MR results, uh, we found out that under aversive anticipation, that is when they were presented with this red square suggesting that there will be aversive thing coming next, we see a, we, we've seen a um, significant reduction of the functional activation in the ventral striatum. Uh, is a very important component of the subcortical region. We also, uh, when, th when they were presented with aversive images, uh, we see a significant and a decreased functional activation in the inferior frontal cortex in the post-capstotomy patients. And when they were shown Im gray images, like uh, neutral images that they initially expected to be aversive, we, sh we have uh, we've show uh, reduced uh, activation in the rostral anterior cingulate, which is a very important component in the prefrontal area. Well, in other words, capstotomy procedure appears to reverse the excessive reactivity to these aversive situations in the frontal prefrontal area, such as the rostral anterior cingulate, if you're a frontal cortex, but also in the subcortical regions, such as the ventral striatum. These findings are consistent with our initial hypothesis that functional normalization of these overactivated, uh, overactivated frontal subcortical structures may be the underlying reason why capstotomy procedure is working in OCD patients. Uh, besides the um, activation of these discrete anatomical structures, we, as I mentioned before, uh, the frontal subcortical hyperconnectivity between these two areas is also implicated in the, in the dysfunction of the emotional processing in OCD. Here, the green bar over here, the dark green bar over here, showed an excessive functional connectivity between the frontal area and the ventral striatum in OCD patients without any surgical history. And further, this enhanced functional connectivity gets normalized uh, following the capstotomy procedure rep represented by the shaded area here, a decreased uh, strength of connectivity compared in OCD patients after surgery compared to those without surgery. So uh, the finding, this finding, accorded perfectly with our hypothesis that this hyperconnected frontal subcortical pathway gets rectified following the capstotomy procedure. Well, 
uh, to wrap up the talk today in this study, we managed to, to provide, we provided the further evidence that the, uh, the efficacy about capstotomy in new city is supported by findings of improvements in their symptoms, their depression, and their quality of life. And secondly, this surgery has no significant impairments in cognition, which means that the capstotomy procedure is relatively safe, and, and safe, uh, and especially in your, co in your general cognitive abilities. And moreover, we find out that the aversive processing might be implicated in the neural substrates underlying the effectiveness of capstotomy. And in the future, uh, neuro stereotactic neurosurgeries or even novel brain stimulation techniques should consider targeting the white matter tracks shown here in red. The connection should consider targeting the connection, the white matter track connecting the prefrontal area and the subcortical area to preserve the ventral striatum because target along this pathway proves to be the most effective and might be of help for future target optimization. Well, um, that's all for my talk today. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Dr. Valerie Vaughan, and also uh, my colleagues that have helped the experiments. And also, luckily, this research and the study has recently been accepted and published online. If any of you are interested to know more details about it, please feel free to check the paper yourself. Thank you. So we're going to have some time for questions. Uh, if anyone would like to raise their hand, we'll pass the mic over to you. Yeah. Back. Thank you. I have a working question. Oh, that's good. Um, did you notice any symptomatic differences with these patients? Um, uh, you mean after the surgery? Or? Yeah, after them. Have, did they notice actually that their OCD did get better or is that something that yeah, wasn't? Exactly. Yeah, so <coughs> they're tested using those uh, symptomatic skill uh, as an objective assessment. And then they will be, there will be also other assessments over their general functions, such as quality of life. And they're coming, uh, some, most, uh, and they're like half of those patients after the surgery can go back to their work. Before that, they couldn't, they just couldn't, they just have to stay home or hospitalized. Yes, so um, they do have symptoms. They do have improvement in their symptoms, and also the, the, um, the accept the or the acknowledge this, the improvements as well. And you can see the the depression has been relieved. Yeah, but although we didn't find any uh, significant improvements in their anxiety, which I didn't <laughs> put on the slides because of time limitation, but the depression state has been uh, has been improved. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Do, do your results shine any light on why it doesn't work in 50%? You said 50% of people that have that surgery, it works. Yes. So could you get any insight into why it doesn't work for the other 50%? Well, uh, as, I, um, as I just briefly mentioned in the mechanism, uh, the OCD pathophysiology, physiology, because this is our current understanding is what is happening in OCD people's brain. We do have lots of things that we don't know. So this process um, involving the prefrontal subcortical um, like dysregulated function of neural circuits maybe is only existed in some of those patients, but other patients may be having other dysfunctions in other neural circuits. So this is the reason. Uh, the, target, well, the reason why we're targeting the anterior limb and internal capsule is actually trying to disrupt this hyperactivity, this dysfunction, the connection between these two areas. But maybe in other patients, they don't have such kind of uh, dysregulated connection. Maybe they, they will be uh, likely to get better if we target another area. Yeah, so this is my uh, guessing of why it's not happening in other 50% of patients. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, do you think that potentially based on fMRI prior to surgery that there would at some point be a potential to actually see whether people could improve with surgery or maybe there's no point in doing the surgery because you can predict that it wouldn't work? That's the excellent question, actually. So this is what uh, the, car the current clinical practice has been trying to do, it's doing some prediction. Just don't put them through this thing. Just to let them know if they're likely or not to be able to, to get better through the surgery. So there is a now a novel technique called MR-guided focused ultrasounds. I think that has the potential of doing things like this. We can ask those people to do a task like this before they go through the surgery. If they're showing something, we are expecting to see, like, 
like this excessive connectivity between the frontal area with the subcortical cortex, then we'll know, yeah, likely this person is having a hyper-connected prefrontal subcortical pathway. So maybe doing an anterior capstopomy will help these people. And for others, if we couldn't see any kind of a hyper-excessive uh, functional connectivity or activation, then we probably should think about other alternative ways to help them to relieve. So this is my guessing. Excellent. Yeah. That sounds really promising. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Can I say, first of all, how much I enjoyed your presentation and apologize for the ignorance that uh, underpins my question. No, no. Um, and this ignorance stems from my uh, trying to understand how much um, nurture is a part of OCD, because what we've looked at so far is nature. So in other words, how the brain is wired and constructed. Would you say uh, among certain OCD patients that OCD is a result of their upbringing and their environment? Yes, you are actually asking the reason of why people are getting OCD. Uh, we do have some, uh, we do have some like genetic reasons or upbringing reasons as well. And we also, this OCD symptoms that can also be resulted from like infections. If you, any of you have ever heard of a disorder named PANDAS, is a um, is happening in like children. So uh, after a streptococcal infection, uh, like within three months, they are suddenly developing to something like some, like a, a specific compulsive, a compulsive symptoms or ADHD, there are also reasons that can actually lead to OCD. So uh, to your uh, question, whether the upbrain is something to be related to OCD, I think it definitely is. But still, I have this uh, kind of belief that it's not that, not that highly correlated with um, upbrain as depression. So depression is, is more likely to be associated with the way people have been upbringing. But for the OCD thing, currently we don't have to have a clear picture of why white is like that. And you know, an infection can also <laughs> can also result in something like this. So uh, this is like a huge, huge ground to be explored in the future. <laughs> yeah. So I think we actually have time for one more, if there's anyone else. Thank you. So our next speaker is Sally Yan. And Sally is an MPhil student in the History and Philosophy of Medicine program. And she's also the Logistics Officer for the WRE. So I might be biased in introducing her. Forgive me. Um, so we're going to hear from Sally about um, the subject of parasitology, but through a humanities lens. And we're going to hear a bit about how um, she traces the scientific depictions of tropical diseases and how these have changed over the past 120 years. Sally. Good morning, and thank you, Dan, for that lovely introduction. Um, as Dan said, I'm an MPhil student studying the history of medicine, and today I will be presenting on one of my projects for the MPhil course titled From Series to Cycles, Depictions of Parasite Development and Transmission from 1898 to 1955. Now, for those of us with a background in biology or medicine, this image, that of the parasite life cycle diagram, might be quite familiar to us. But for those less familiar, essentially, these show three different elements, the human host, the parasite, and the vector. And there's arrows that connect these elements, pointing out the development of the parasite and its transmission between the human host and the vector. Historians of tropical medicine have also emphasized that such parasite life cycles are critical to the history of tropical medicine, distinguishing these fields of tropical medicine and parasitology in colonial territories from that of bacteriology and imperial metropoles. However, when I began to look for these life cycles diagrams that were at the beginning of tropical medicine, 
I found a surprising lack, and in fact, a delay in the appearance of the actual parasite life cycle as a diagram. In 1898, Patrick Manson's first edition of his textbook, Diseases of Warm Climates, established the field of tropical medicine. However, it wasn't until 1916, in the sixth edition of his textbook, that the first parasite life cycle diagram actually appears. Now, why is this important to look at? Why should we look at the history of one specific image in science? This can be situated in the historiography of images in the history of science. Scientific images reflect and inform ways of seeing and knowing. Diagrams, in turn, are one type of scientific image that generalize insufficient information and then reduce the complexity of entangled relationships. Furthermore, cycles are one type of diagram, and they appear as a recurrent theme in the history of biology and medicine, as Hops, Hopwood has discussed in his 2021 20, review paper. And there he mentions life cycle diagrams as one particular type of diagram and invites further consideration upon these themes. So it's amidst this historiography that I examined depictions of parasite development and transmission in English language medical textbooks and scientific publications throughout the beginning of the 20th century. And I will specifically discuss three parasites as case studies today. The actual scientific information about these parasites or their medical criteria aren't super important, but we're just gonna keep track of these three different parasites. They are malaria as labeled in the pink caused by plasmodium parasites, trypanosomiasis, labeled in the yellow, caused by trypanosoma parasites, and lymphatic filariasis, which is caused by filaria bancrofti, which was later renamed Wuchereria bancrofti. What I argue here is that the proliferation of the parasite life cycle diagram is linked to a new, what I call, ecological way of seeing that emerged from the 1920s to the 1950s. And I will trace this emergence in three sections. First, I will establish a timeline of the scientific discoveries of parasite development and transmission. In 1877, Patrick Manson, the author of the textbook I described, discovered that the mosquito acted as a nurse for the transmission of filaria, essentially being able to specifically receive but not specifically transmit the, the parasite. In 1897, Ronald Ross corrected this conception for, but for um, for malaria, um, describing the mosquito as a vector able to both specifically receive and transmit the parasite. This series of discoveries constituted the great induction of tropical medicine and the establishment of the parasite vector model. From here, scientists dis identified the vectors and in intermediate hosts of different parasitic diseases in quick succession. And for our purposes, in 1904, David Bruce discovered that the tsetse fly acted as a vector for trypanosoma. And in 1911, King in New York further elaborated that game animals were an intermediate hosts for trypanosoma. However, these scientific discoveries of parasite development and transmission far preceded the appearance of actual life cycle diagrams. The initial reports of these discoveries actually didn't feature any images of parasite development at all. And the earliest subsequent images were that of developmental series arranged in linear order. Early depictions of developmental series may be attributed to limitations in scientific discoveries or experimental methods. For example, in this image from Manson's textbook, there is a partial developmental series of filaria and mosquitoes. And this could be simply due to the fact that there's easier experimental access to mosquitoes. You could imagine that it's easier to cut up a mosquito at different time points and look at the parasites inside than for a human, for example. Um, this was also true for other parasites, such as this developmental series of trypanosoma in Moore and Brinell's 1908 textbook, where it is solely the developmental series inside a laboratory rat model. Furthermore, at this point in time, the reproduction in the tsetse fly had actually not yet been characterized. But these depictions as developmental series, and specifically even as partial developmental series, persisted after full scientific characterizations of the transmission and development of different parasites. This image of the developmental series of trypanosoma again appears in Master's 1920 textbook. And as you can see, it looks really similar to the image on the left. And this is despite the fact that the vectors and game animals had been identified a decade prior at this point. 
And again, for malaria in Manson's 1898 textbook after the 1877 characterization, here is a full developmental series of three different plasmodium species in parallel with each other. Even though the development is drawn throughout the mosquito in human phases, the transmission between these are not labeled, and the mosquito and human do not appear at all. And I attribute to these depictions as developmental series to an embryological way of seeing. Now, what I mean by this is that these parasite developmental series looked a lot like the developmental series created by embryologists for human and mammalian embryos, as you can see on the right here. In both of these, each stage is represented by a single idealized form, broken up by the development of parts rather than by fixed time intervals. And there's a cyclical nature implied through words such as the cyclical metamorphosis of a parasite or a cycle of representation for an embryo. But it's actually drawn as a line, not a circle, but the final form implicitly serves as a source for the first form. These developmental series are highly reductionist in their focus only on the individual organism. Life cycle diagrams began to emerge at the end of this time period. The first life cycle diagram was that of malaria and appeared in Manson's 1916 textbook. And this looks a lot like the life cycle diagrams we are familiar with today, but this visual form actually was not widely imitated. Instead, early life cycle diagrams looked more like this, which drew the developmental stages of the parasite in high detail and arranged them in a cyclical order but they essentially just look like cyclicized developmental series. The human host and the vectors were not illustrated and labeled, and there is a dash line across the page to indicate the transmission between, to imply the transmission between the human and mosquito phase, but this isn't actually explicitly labeled. In contrast, by the 1940s, these diagrams started to focus more on the human host and vectors and look like more like what we expect today such as you can see from Ashton Spitz 1945 textbook of Filaria and Mosquitoes. Here, the illustrations of the parasites become a lot more schematic. The human host and the vectors are drawn, and there's transmission mechanisms, such as microphilia enters mosquito that are labeled. But it also preserves this sort of concept of the dash line that indicates the transmission between the human and mosquito phases. Later life cycle diagrams, such as that of Bucheriaria bacrofti and Trypanosoma in Faust's 1955 textbook, became increasingly dominated by these vectors, intermediate hosts, and humans. The parasites become dots and squiggles in the diagram on the left and disappeared from view altogether from the right. The vectors and intermediate hosts are disproportionately large, as you can see as from the comically large mosquitoes on the left. It's rather terrifying. And the game animals on the right, which, and vectors on the right, which each look equal in size to each other. So these essentially became illustrations of the transmission pathways between these different elements rather than focused on the development of the parasite. And these developments emerge alongside an ecological way of seeing. What I mean by this is that during this time period, disease ecology emerged as a field. In the 1920s, Theobald Smith established disease ecology as an analytical framework for understanding the interactions between microorganisms and hosts. And in the 1940s, MacFarlane Burnett further elaborated this, saying infectious disease was a competition between hosts and parasites. In this model, the human became an ecological organism, equal only in importance to the different vectors and intermediate hosts, and the parasites became de-emphasized. And these life cycle diagrams were still reductionist in a different way, in omitting non-living environments and the social worlds of the humans. I believe that this line of inquiry offers an important implication. Specifically, that it denaturalizes the parasite life cycle diagram and allows us to imagine more holistic ways of seeing and addressing disease, incorporating social determinants of health and the impact of factors such as climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. We'll be taking questions for Sally. Does anyone have any questions? 
Yes, yes. Jonathan. Hey, hey, thanks, Sally, for a wonderful talk. Again, totally not biased, like the rest <laughs> of our committee. Um, one question that I have here concerning, like, essentially the innovative part of these discoveries and of the evolution of these life cycle diagrams. Actually, before we came up with this form of the life cycle diagram, was it common anywhere else in the medical or biological literature to have those sort of diagrams, like, also have loops within themselves, where like it isn't quite just generally the circle of life, but also the circle of life with all these internal connections between the different components. Yeah, so I think the idea of where cycles appeared in the history of biology and medicine is really interesting, and Hopwood's article addresses this a lot. There's so many examples of things being illustrated in a cyclical fashion throughout, throughout all of history in different parts of biology and medicine, such as perhaps the cycle for um, women's reproduction and things like that. But as far as things like the cycle of life and things related to ecology would apply, all of this, as far as I found, sort of emerged in the same time period. I believe it was also around the very end of the 1800s to the beginning of the 1900s that uh, the idea of the cycle of life and the cycling of nutrients by microorganisms and by plants across the ecological system um, also became a focus for ecologists. Um, perhaps such, such as Sergei Wadogradsky, if you might have heard of him, um, and of course other ecologists as well. Lovely, thank you. Hello, thank you for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Um, I, just, I just have one question. I don't know if this is this overlaps with your research at all, but did you see when um, the textbooks didn't have the image that any uh, how they were going to address the parasite life cycle in terms of reducing disease was that brought in when you had those diagrams and images, or were they able to treat things without the pictures or? Was there any reference to that in the textbooks at all? Yes, I think that's a really important distinction to draw. So I started looking into this question because it is actually said that from the beginning of his the history of tropical medicine that addressing the different stages in development in the parasite and stopping them in order to prevent transmission of disease was always a focus for parasitologists and doctors who wanted diseases to not infect local populations, but especially not infect, um, come back to the home countries of these um, colonial empires. So this is discussed and is also reflected in the primary sources that I found. It's just that these are sort of labeled as words and discussed as life histories, but they aren't drawn. And as I said, I think that there is something that um, a visual form and images and sciences um, that shapes our way of understanding and seeing the world that perhaps just simply saying the words um, and saying the information does not. Uh, thank you so much, Sally. Um, I think one question that I had was, um, how did people understand these tropical diseases before the onset of, I guess, tropical science or whatever you call it? Because I mean, a lot of people must have encountered these diseases even before the 1870s. So I'm wondering, I mean, what kind of theories did they have before this field emerged? Oh gosh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I sort of became interested in like med uh, the history of medicine, tropical medicine, because of all the different theories people had for diseases and especially for infectious diseases as they encountered, encountered them in colonial territories. Um, two of the main frameworks for understanding them that had that basically had extended all the way back to the ancient Greeks, to Hippoc Hippocrates, um, were the idea of constitutional medicine, which was that everyone had individual constitutions and balances of these four different substances called humors, and that people were, humors were adapted to a specific environment. So when Europeans immigrated to, not immigrated, went to and colonized different territories, um, they could not adjust to the new uh, environments because they had a different um, constitution and a balance of humors, and that's why they became sick. Alternatively, there was an idea of miasma, where um, 
substances in the air or water would cause disease in a local area, which is kind of similar to our conceptions of like waterborne diseases and such today. But it was like very much the idea that smelly water or dirty areas air in itself could cause disease. And these sort of all became rolled into um, the germ theory and shaped by that after this time period, after um, Louis Pasteur and um, Robert Koch and all of them in this period and tropical medicine sort of emerged out of that tradition. Any other questions? Thank you, Sally. Thank you. Just a second, sorry. All right, so our third speaker this morning is Min Kyu Kim who's a first year student in studying a PhD uh, in film and uh, has a particular interest in visual representations of the nuclear uh, and also happens to be a stalwart of our All Greys rugby team. <laughs> so we'll be hearing from Min Kyu on a comparative study of various media depicting nuclear energy over the past 40 years or so and how these depictions have shaped public perceptions of science, nuclear safety and political ideologies amongst others. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Um, I'll just get my my timer up so I don't go over time. So this morning I'll be presenting on the title "The Ghost of Chernobyl" or "The Spectre of Communism: Documentary Drama and Nuclear Disaster." I'll be comparing and contrasting two different genres of filmmaking, namely Vladimir Shevchenko's documentary "Chernobyl: Chronicle of Difficult Weeks." and Craig Mazin's HBO television series Chernobyl, which I'm sure some of you um, might have seen. Uh, Russia's war against Ukraine has very much reawakened our fears of nuclear disaster, from the explicit threat of a nuclear exchange to the alarming reports of sabotage and terrorism at the Zaporizhia nuclear power station. Interrogating what we know, see, and hear of the nuclear on the screen is an urgent task which seeks to arrest any sleepwalking into a disaster, accidental or otherwise, of untold consequences for people and the environment. And I hope this kind of addresses the interdisciplinarity of the Wolfson Research event. And uh, yeah, I'll cut straight to it. The image is also of, uh, uh, is a replica of the contaminated camera that Vladimir Shevchenko used to document the events of Chernobyl. <clears throat> this will be the structure of my talk, and I'll cut straight to the history. Shortly after the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, Commercial nuclear power plants, with the promise of unprecedented clean energy, began to be integrated into civil society. However, the primary purpose of some of these plants was to produce plutonium for military usage. And the very interoperability of these dual capacity reactors has led to some disasters, most notably at the Mayak, Windscale, and indeed Chernobyl plants. And since the integration of nuclear power into everyday life, we are all, to different degrees, citizens of what Ulrich Beck calls a risk society, for him, Chernobyl only revealed what has become true for many, if not all of us, the closeness of risk nuclear disaster in our everyday lives. We might understand nuclear disaster as constructing a hyper-object, which is to refer to something that's massively distributed in time and space relative to humans, and hyper-objects like radioactivity and global warming are non-local. They're so immense that they can't be located in the precise location of the time, and we as humans can only see fragments of them. Hyper-objects, I argue, yield a form of slow violence. This, this, slow, this slow violence is incremental and accretive and is neither spectacular nor instantaneous. And we might consider, for instance, how exposure to radioactivity for pregnant women increased the likelihood of congenital birth defects for their children in the years and decades to come. 
This form of slow violence, I argue, also operates in the register of a visuality. Unlike a gunshot or a bomb explosion, these forms of incremental violence are incredibly difficult to perceive. So how do the representations of Chernobyl grapple with such concepts? In the aftermath of the meltdown, Chino uh, Ukrainian filmmaker Vladimir Shoshenko went to document the unfolding disaster within the 30 kilometer square exclusion zone. Approaching by helicopter, Shevchenko managed to capture footage from the sky, almost directly above the fire at the reactor, which is emitting the radioactive material comparable to 400 bombs dropped in Hiroshima. This hyperobjectivity of the radioactive fallout was carried by the jet stream far beyond the exclusion zone and was felt right across the continent. And I'll show you a clip of the footage he managed to get. <laughs> У нее есть только голос. Вот он. На экране один из кадров, который студийный АТК сначала задержал как брак. Но это не брак. Это зримый лик радиации. Вглядитесь. Pretty haunting stuff. Um, as you can see, the resulting footage was heavily pockmarked and carried extensive signs of extraneous audio interference. This is a result of the radioactive particles penetrating the frame of Shenko's camera and animating the immersive properties of his film stock. And it's in this moment, the conventional standard relationship of the camera and the object is reversed. It's no longer simply Shevchenko documenting the disaster, it's the ghost of radioactivity inscribing itself and placing this unbearable pressure on the materiality of the film. Shevchenko's documentary argue becomes a kind of spirit medium upon, upon which the ghost of radioactivity performs its kind of illegible, incoherent, and yet threatening atomic writing. If radioactivity is kind of the villain of the documentary, then the hero is the scientist Valery Legasov, um, the first deputy director of the Kachatov Institute for Atomic Energy, and the scientific authority who is tasked with containing the fallout and examining the um, causes for the disaster. The climax of the documentary leads to Legasov delivering a, a report to the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, on the findings of the disaster. And after weeks of discussions, he and the experts of the IAEA concluded that the issues lay in the unresolved interaction issues between man and machine. The film therefore emphasizes the challenges of negotiating the nuclear's unprecedented capacity for both immense construction and destruction. Moving on to the 2019 HBO series, and in the absence of real life shooting on location at the, at the time, Chernobyl, backed by the largesse of HBO, adopts innovative, ingenious approaches of representing the imperceptible. I'll play you a clip here. In this slow motion sequence in the so-called bridge of death scene, we sort of see the slow, invisible violence of radioactivity. As the passage of time slows down from the conventional rate of 24 frames per second, we enter the world of the hyper object, manifesting its uh, slow violence in a temporal scale that humans are not normally able to register. Only then do we begin to perceive the small, the infinitesimal particles of the radioactive fallout and Chernobyl. There's a sad, dramatic irony as only we, the audience, have the sort of privilege of seeing the proliferation of radioactivity in the air. And the soundtrack, which is composed of ambient sounds recorded um, in a nuclear reactor of a similar design to Chernobyl, further sort of warn us to the malevolence of the nuclear Moreover, the presence of young children and babies in the scene uh, sort of alerts us to the slow violence of radioactivity and kind of how the slow violence will unfold over time. We meet our hero again, Valery Legasov, this time played by Jared Harris. And the series very much centers on his hero journey from an apparatchik of the party to a de facto whistleblower who reveals the flaws of Soviet governance. And here we begin to see a real departure from the documentary. The climax of the HBO series takes place in a real life trial. I, I sort of realized the room looks a bit similar to this hall here. <laughs> um, of Brikhanov, Dyatlov and Fomin, each variously responsible for the operation of the Chernobyl plant. Instead of delivering his report to the IAEA, Legasov is fictitiously inserted into this trial. And in this trial, Legasov is no longer just a scientist, 
completing his kind of hero journey from the apparatchik of the party to prosecuting the state itself, Legasov holds to account not just Brukhanov, Dyatlov, and Fermin for their individual errors, but more broadly and pressingly, the, the mode of Soviet governance and the fallibility of Soviet ideology itself. Effectively, Legasov puts the Soviet state on trial. This is not just in front of the attendees of the court, but contemporary audiences watching the series. He blames the Soviet state for practices of cost-cutting and covering up the disaster. At one time, he suggests that such a disaster could not happen in the West because of its protective measures around nuclear plants, which is a simple mistruth which disguises the history of nuclear accidents in the West, um, most notably at Three Mile Island just years prior to the disaster at Chernobyl. Legasov's speech argues that lies are the defining feature of Soviet ideology and that lies cause the RBMK reactor to explode. And so it's not the ghost of radioactivity that prevails in this scene, but the spectre of communism. I'd like to finish my comparative analysis with this side-by-side -side viewing of Vladimir Shoshenko's Chernobyl, Chronicle of Difficult Weeks on the left, and HBO's Chernobyl on the right. Both epilogues, coincidentally, take an eagle eye view over the woodlands surrounding Chernobyl. It's kind of an uncanny similarity. On the left, Shevchenko concludes that the events of Chernobyl inform our understanding of the nuclear as a hyper object, immense in its capacity for both creation and for destruction. There's a real pathos to this because Shevchenko later died of the slow violence of radioactivity from the exposure that he had on site at Chernobyl. Um, Therefore, even as a viewer of this film, we're reminded that there is no such thing as a safe distance from radioactivity. There's no safe distance from the hyper object of its nuclear and its capacity for slow violence. Meanwhile, HBO's Chernobyl concludes on a cautionary statement about the cost of lies. It kind of becomes a moral fable, like the boy who cried wolf. Um, the hyper object of radioactivity the slow violence and its avisuality become visible, sensible, and possible to be spoken about only when the show projects the spectre of communism onto it. Chernobyl therefore becomes a fable, not about the fear of the nuclear, but about ideology. I argue that the operation of the HBO series ties in closely to a wider cultural project of the Red Scare, which has very much become reanimated in recent years with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. As Derrida notes, communism has always been and will, remain, or, and will remain spectral. All phantasms, including the nuclear, are projected onto the screen of this ghost. Today, in the face of complex, ongoing issues surrounding the ecological energy crises, we should continue to interrogate how we best represent the hyper-objectivity of the nuclear and its capacity for slow violence in everyday life. Thank you. Do we have any questions from Minky? Nuri? Uh, thank you so much, Min. Um, so I, I haven't watched the documentary, but I, but I have watched the HBO show, and uh, um, I, I very much agree that it is an indictment of communism, but at the same time, I also felt that it was an indictment of some of the things that were taking place in the West at the, at the time of the production of, 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 of this particular show. So I'm wondering if you could maybe um, speak to that, if you could maybe push back, or if you could um, yeah, offer your opinion on, on this particular reading of, of the show. So um, there was a slide that was cut out for time reasons, but it's, um, I listened to the podcast of Craig Mazin, um, which accompanied the series, and I, I think I sort of quote him verbatim saying that um, the show is not about a fear of the nuclear, uh, and it's about sort of the fear of lies. And then he kind of emphasized the sort of recurrence of nuclear accidents within contemporary Russia, Russian politics today. Um, and it's this kind of con constant scaremongering of nuclear accidents far away, when really Three Mile Island was 30 minutes away from the same kind of meltdown that affected, affected Chernobyl. So I think um, sort of, and with, for sort of, uh, for, the for the purpose of the presentation, I had to simplify things a bit. But I think most audiences going away from having watched the HBO series will kind of think of the, of the nuclear as something that's contained in the past or indeed in a sort of other faraway place and not realize how close we've been to disasters of a very similar nature in the West as well. So I do think, um, yeah, I mean, nuclear radioactivity, radioactive fallout doesn't care for ideology. So we should all be aware of the, the potential consequences of it. Okay. 
Hey, hey, thank you for the talk. It was some really interesting stuff. I was wondering, with a bit of a more recent perspective, because that band Chernobyl is in Ukraine, like it is also where recently, in the Russia-Ukraine war, there was at least a period where it was attacked and so on. Um, how much are some of the themes that you're talking about, like, does, do they and did they include, perhaps, any enmity towards the Ukrainian people, or generally towards the culture over there, when looking back on it back then? Or is it even seen, in, like, as far as you know, at least, I know sadly very little about this, these days within the conflict and like with parts of it that were seen there with regards to Chernobyl? Yeah, if I sort of understand the question correctly, and one of the things I found interesting is that um, Chernobyl kind of becomes this window for Ukraine to enter the West uh, because they become the victims of this kind of Soviet arrogance and sort of experimenting with technology. So Ukraine very much enters kind of the Western hemisphere um, as, as, as victims of Soviet aggression. And what's kind of occluded in that is the fact that most of the radioactive fallout ended up in Belarus, which obviously is still very much seen in a kind of regressive way as a dictatorial society, and obviously which is one still complicit with Russian aggression against Ukraine today. So we keep erecting these kind of ideological boundaries to something that keeps on defying scientific containment. And I think kind of seeing Chernobyl just as a Ukrainian disaster, and you know, in the context of the war today, like Russian soldiers who haven't been given proper information about the, the dangers of Chernobyl today, they've been farming, eating, drinking from the waters around Chernobyl. And just yesterday I read a news report that they've been reporting sickness of, um, reports of radiation sickness from that. So again, like we can argue the morality of the invasion, but for these Russian soldiers who haven't been told about the radioactive dangers of Chernobyl, we really need to push past these kind of ideological and national boundaries and consider sort of, yeah, the health effects of this um, great danger. Fascinating, thank you. Min, thank you so much. Um, I, I could, I, I, I won't go into the, the sort of all the granular comments that I'd like to make about your use of Russian and Ukrainian sources and other places you might look. I wanted to shift to the conceptual framework that you used and ask whether this concept of the hyper object and the difficult, uh, difficulty of visualizing something so uh, cataclysmic as nuclear disaster, whether, whether you could um, sort of generalize from that to thinking about how we're attempting to depict climate change. Because I, so, so to shift, shift away from what I know about to the general framework of this um, argument, it, maybe it's not a fair question, but it occurred to me as you were making your um, really fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm sure people have also maybe seen the film Don't Look Up, which is like the second most viewed film in Netflix history. Um, the production company for Don't Look Up is actually called Hyper Object Industries. And the, the guy who founded the company said that he, wanted, he read Timothy Morton's work and wanted to make a, uh, a film about climate change and ecological disaster that would kind of grapple with the idea of the hyper object. And what I found interesting about it is that it's kind of this comet that's coming for an extinction level event and it's going to endanger the earth. And the solution that the film offers to this kind of um, arriving comet is to fire nuclear missiles at it. And it's only foiled because they find some kind of like profitable minerals on the comet and the kind of the White House's attempt to um, explode the comet is, yeah, is, is foiled. And you kind of see in that film this interesting kind of uh, solution of the nuclear being offered as a solution to this like extinction level event. And obviously it's nuclear, nuclear missiles, not nuclear power plants. But there's still this kind of idea of the nuclear having this capacity for the hope and salvation of a humanity that faces extinction. So I think even film companies and you know, film directors that want to grapple with the idea of the hyper object and sort of come at it from quite a progressive way, they still can fall into this trap of thinking that the nuclear is this unbounded energy source that can sort of, yeah, um, hold the key to our future. Thank you. Um. So just uh, one more question. So regarding the TV show um, Chernobyl, you said you know, they focus probably more on the ideological aspects rather than showing, depicting the destruction of nuclear um, power. So I'm, I'm asking this because I feel like for TV producers, um, in order for the TV show to gain more popularity, it's probably 
somewhat inevitable that they have to conform to some public opinions and sometimes, in, I mean, in this case, the fear of communism. So I'm, I'm thinking like in more practical terms, like in the future, how do you motivate TV producers to, you know, like address like the destruction of nuclear power directly rather than like going to other like aspects? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, Craig Mazin, the sort of the producer for the series, was best known for his work on The Hangover Part Two prior to this. And I think you still see these kind of comic elements because you're meant to kind of prod fun at these like bumbling Soviet scientists who aren't up to the standard of the Western accomplished sort of um, technology. And yeah, I mean, this might be a bit specific therefore to the HBO series because this guy sort of comes at it from a comedy background. Um, but I, I, sort of I alluded to at the end, there is this kind of wider project of like the Red Scare that I still think is relevant today. And um, an academic review I read of the series said that slinging mud at the Eastern Bloc remains an ever popular thing to do for Western audiences. So I think it's going to take someone who's quite brave and um, maybe not someone from the genre of comedy to really tackle the issue of the nuclear in a way that actually communicates the, the, the slow violence and, and sort of the hyper objectivity of the nuclear. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. All right, so our final speaker of this morning's session is Stephen Chu, who is a master's student in developmental studies and has a particular research interest in the development, developmental factors ongoing in China uh, related to urbanization and development there. Um, and the presentation will explore how Chinese county governments can use different approaches within the central government's policies to achieve economic development using Wuyi County as a case study. All right, I'm actually very nervous right now because the previous three presentations are very, very good. Um, okay, so before I introduce my research, let me ask you this question that is often faced by um, economists and policymakers nowadays. How do we achieve economic development? So the first answer that comes to your mind is probably that we are going to build a strong manufacturing sector. You think about microchips and biotechnology, these high value added industries, but then there are actually many other alternatives to, um, to economic development. And today I'll be talking about tourism, specifically tourism developed in China, uh, in China's counties. So the title of my research is a development model of counter tourism in China, a case study of Wu Yi. So the aim of my research is to understand how the Wu government facilitated um, local tourism development. And my research uses a mixed method case study uh, under which both qualitative and quantitative data are collected and analyzed. Um, it divides Wu's tourism development uh, into four stages. It analyzes the policy and institutional innovations conducted by the local state at each development stage. So, I mean, at this, at this point, you might be wondering why we, you know, am I just picking a random county? But of course not. Um, despite being categorized as one of the um, poorest counties in Jordan province in the 1990s, the county has now achieved a GDP per capita of roughly 40,000 yuan, which is 16% higher than national average. And such rapid transformation of the county cannot be achieved without a thriving tourism sector. So the county has been consistently ranked as one of the top 100 counties of tourism competitiveness in China for the past few years. So these two pictures are just to show you where we is roughly located in China. And um, the next two pictures we're taking at two points in time to show how tourism development has transformed the county. Um, so let me just go straight into the first development stage, which is called the expo exploration stage. So the inception of Wuyi's tourism development was marked by the establishment of the Wuyi Tourism Office, which was in charge of the um, identification and extraction of local tourism resources. 
but you know, uh, it later went through a structural reform uh, in 1996 and became known as the Wuyi Tourism Administration or the WTA. So compared to the Tourism Office, uh, the WTA has more tough specialization and it is um, um, best able to coordinate across various government sectors. Um, so in the beginning um, of all these tourism developments, there was a lack of private uh, investment in the tourism sector. So to compensate for that, the government actually stepped in and established a number of state-owned tourism business. Uh, one notable example is that uh, the government established the Wuyi Travel Agency uh, in 1991. And at the same year, the Wuyi government started providing trainings for local tourism service suppliers. Um, um, so it began recruiting and training um, tour guides and later formalized the training course into a degree program. The government also later introduced another professional degree in tourism and hospitality management to provide basic training for, um, um, for the managers of small and medium local tourism businesses. So just to summarize, although we failed to complete the development of many tourist attractions during the exploration stage, um, the government addressed a shortage of private investment in tourism businesses and improved the quality of tourism supply which adequately, adequately prepared the county for the, for the subsequent opening of tourist attraction to external visitors. Um, so it was, um, the, the exploration stage was followed by the initiation stage, and the inception of this stage was uh, marked by Wui's um, successful opening of its first ever tourist resort. And um, the, success, the, uh, the successful opening of that attraction could be attributed to the WTA's recognition um, of the limited of Wuyi's limited state capacity in resort uh, development, which sort of incentivize it to launch a series of campaigns to encourage more community involvement in uh, to complement the state's effort. So to attract external tourism investment, the Wuyi government at this stage also provided numerous financial incentives. Um, for example, they um, subsidized um, investors purchased local properties and they gave uh, a three-year tax cut for income in tourist businesses. The government also sought to create favorable institutional environments by emphasizing better protection of property rights and eliminating any government red tape. But the quality and quantity of local tourism supply were still worrying to the policymakers during the initiation stage. So the government shifted its policy objectives to tighten rule enforcement and sp spur more private tourism investment which heralded the expansionary stage. So the top priority of the WTA during this stage was to enforce regulations of unlicensed businesses. And it did so through collaborating with various local state departments, such as the Bureau of Industry and Commerce, uh, the, the Department of Police. They also collaborated with non-state non stakeholders, such as the local media. Um, so at this stage, the government also experimented with public-private partnerships to expedite the, constru the construction of tourist resorts by tapping into the expertise of private businesses. Um, so towards the end of the, um, the expansionary stage, 13 more travel agencies were established and, um, and uh, the total tourism output rose from 59 million yuan to roughly 2,600 million yuan uh, in 2011, a 45-fold increase. Oh. It's missing the beautiful diagram, actually. Uh, I think the slides are not updated. Um, so the last stage is called the diversification stage, which is still ongoing. Um, so the, the beginning of the stage was, uh, was when the Wii government announced All for One Tourism as its um, overarching tourism development objective. And what All for One Tourism basically advocates is is multi-sectorial participation in tourism development. And this basically symbolizes a counter shift towards greater tourism product diversification. So to accommodate um, the incoming businesses from other economic sectors in Wuyi, um, the WTA adjusted local financial institutions' um, credit policies to streamline lending to tourism businesses with preferential interest rate. And they were able to do it because the local financial sector was largely controlled by the state. I mean, most of the commercial banks in Wuyi were essentially um, state-owned commercial banks. And it was at, also at this stage where we saw a closer state business relationship. Um, so the Wuyi Hot Springs Town was established in 
2015 as a platform to show a variety of uh, tourism businesses as seen on in this picture. Uh, but more importantly, it possesses a township government and the spatial proximity uh, granted business um, easy access to the local bureaucrats to foster strong state business relations uh, and also acquire more targeted support from the local government. So the outcome of uh, all foreign tourism has been hugely impressive. So four scenic spots have been named national 4A attractions since the inception of the diversification um, phase, uh, diversification stage. So when I call this a um, tourism development model, it needs to have a certain level of applicability outside the context of UI. So I've summarized three governance principles from UI's tourism development experience. So the first principle is um, a coordination unit. So uh, the WTA basically solved three coordination problems that could potentially hinder tourism development in UI. Um, the first one is the lack of private investment in the initial development phases. The second one is the lack of development finance from private banking. The third coordination problem is collaboration with other agents in rural enforcement. And the second governance principle is gradualist planning. So instead of like, um, instead of like draining limited government capacity over range distortions in the beginning phase, um, the, the WE uh, government actually focuses resources on the most binding constraint in, in the first development stage, which was the construction of basic tourism supply and more importantly, a tourism management institution. And the same gradualist approach was adopted for all subsequent development phases. The third principle